Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special edition of the Indie Heads podcast here. I'll be your guide for the evening. Uh, AJ, I'm sitting here at the El Cortez in Brooklyn, New York, with uh, the artist behind one of my favorite records of the year so far, Mr. Fred Thomas. Hi, how's it going? Good. We're all doing well here. It's a beautiful, sunny evening here in New York. So um, I guess we were sort of just chatting about it a little bit earlier. Um, I got turned on to your music earlier this year. I saw you open for The World is a Beautiful Place and I'm No Longer Afraid to Die, one of our favorite bands on the podcast here. And I started digging through your record, uh, Changer, which came out earlier this year, and your extensive back catalog, actually, and found that there's a lot of definitely interesting things I wanted to chat with you about, especially about being from Michigan, being on sort of a major label, having a label of your own, and being a big part of all of these kind of smaller acts for like a really long time now. So let's start with uh, Changer, I guess. Okay. So what really sort of turned me on to your music at that show there was the conversational nature of it it's it's almost sort of like blurs into sort of spoken word confessional poetry I don't know it sort of seemed like is what struck me performing live um, how did your songwriting sort of reach that that level um, well it's interesting you saw a show where I told a ridiculously personal story do you remember that part of the yes I do I, ha- I had a mental note about that okay, one yeah um, just for everyone who, who was not at the show who's listening um, mover shakers a band from uh, Michigan that Opened up the show. I played second. World has played last. The Mover Shaker was so tremendous. I'd never seen them play before, but um, they kind of had like a, a Smashing Pumpkins vibe a little bit. And I told a story about when I was seventeen and saw the Smashing Pumpkins on my birthday, and like disgusted this friend of mine by offering him like uh, a shirt to wear that I like, you know, ejaculated on like when I was masturbating <laughs> as a kid who masturbated so much, and. I was telling the story, which took like seven minutes to, and it's to a room full of like, maybe like a hundred people. Yeah. And half the people were like, all right. And the other half were like, fuck this guy. I'm walking out of here, you know? But, um, it's kind of interesting that you asked like how my songwriting got to that confessional over Sherry kind of place, because at a certain point I was like, oh man, I just don't say much in my songs. Like I do. And I have songs that are about things to me, but people always are like, cool. You have like a song about like getting broken up with or you have like all these songs that are kind of like romantic and it's like no 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 I, I, I was trying to express so much more so at a certain point I was just like um, fuck it let's go for broke let's lay it all on the line let's lay like uh, some stuff that's gonna be like kind of like disgusting to some people or annoying mostly like people who don't like my songwriting the main complaint is that it's kind of like annoying and grating and it's sort of supposed to be it's sort of supposed to be not vague at all mm-hmm. and um Kind of, kind of ugly to be a person sometimes, and I'd like to express that fully. Yeah, I, I really like kind of the the lack of structure. Almost, there's no like traditional sort of sense of songwriting, chorus, building, all of that sort of stuff. It's very just kind of like it feels like it's all coming out of your head, like right as it's happening. Even I've listened to the you know the album a bunch of times now. It's it all sort of seems just as as spontaneous and everything. So, what's the creative process for you? Like writing that stuff? Do you think of like these anecdotes in your head, and you're like, shit, that's a good line. I gotta write that down. Or are you always working on new stuff? I'm always working on new stuff. It's sort of pieced together in a really kind of like unorganized organization, mm-hmm. if you will. Like it's it's not. You know, someone was like, "Oh, you remind me of Sun Kill Moon." You gotta like listen to Sun Kill Moon. I never heard him before. <laughs> we're uh, we're we're huge Sun Kill Moon fans. This the, the, the podcast here. So yeah, I mean, yeah. it's sort of th- there's definitely a similarity. I think we've sort of talked about that. You've got like a rockier vibe to it. It's very his his music's very like laid back and vi- like almost borderline. Just like is actually talking to that, you. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, like I I had never li- really listened. I listened to like Red House Painters yeah. uh, back in the day, and um, I was like, oh, this guy's talking about like his meal Mm -hmm. he's talking about like his like enlarged prostate and like it's really like he goes on and on and on like he's just sort of like strumming and strumming the guitar and gently telling you like the events of his day Mm -hmm. um and i don't relate to that personally i think it's some of the records i heard are pretty cool benji of course is like everyone's favorite one but it's really good um but what i was kind of more like interested in is like um kind of like structured poetry that sort of like is perpetually looping into itself um and that's why it sometimes seems like um fitting a lot of lyrics into one verse or the words are kind of like catching up with themselves and slowing down again it's 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 all it's very uh mapped out it's not it's not freestyle at all um but it sort of comes off in in that way because i just practice it a lot and and have it have it be what it is on record compared to someone like mark koslick of sun Moon who can like go really long on the new record like over two hours long like oh, yeah. every song's like 10 minutes um, are you cognizant of the fact that this sort of music can kind of 
get like rambly and grating to a listener? Are you cutting yourself off at certain points? You know, I'm not cutting myself off, but like I have, um, if I write a song and I feel like it's really, really long, it's like that song's got to be like eight minutes long. It's so rambly. It's always three minutes. Yeah. You know, so I have no idea if like Mark Kozik feels like he's just like talking for <laughs> a century, but, but I, I never cut myself off. But I always feel like it's important to go a little bit further than you normally would, mm-hmm. you know. And, and sometimes when I play live, I extend things. Or that gets a little bit more freestyle, or a little bit more like, here's like an additional story that like maybe they faded out yeah. on the record or something like that. Yeah, I love the sporadic nature of Changer where like I don't think any of the songs like sound super similar to one another. There's like stylistic differences instrumentally and I think in, in, your, in your presentations and whatnot. There's like a weird part on the back half I think where you sort of get into like this kind of ambient instrumental sort of jammy stuff for like yeah, two yeah. or three songs is that I mean purposeful but what was the sort of intention behind that break well it's really interesting that record uh, I started making it right after I left um, Michigan and moved to Montreal mm-hmm. two years ago and um, it was a huge move uh, lots of like work heading up to it but I went from recording in a studio that I was working at and like full access to drums and everything 24 hours a day to like I'm just making music with headphones in a tiny apartment in this new, you know, French Canadian city. So I got really deep into, okay, cool. I, my wife's in grad school. I don't have a job. I can't speak the language. I already drank four cups of coffee. I guess I'll just make some beats and see how terrible they are. You know, so yeah. like, and, and and I really do feel like uh, I feel really proud of Changer. I do feel like those electronic pieces fit within the framework of kind of like counterpoint to like the really wordy or like proto-political stuff to have like a moment where it's just like and now take a breath mm-hmm. listen to like some sort of like an instrumental you know I was trying to express as much without words as I was with too many words in that and um, depending on how you feel about the record and those songs it if it worked or not it's up to you yeah do you think that's a direction you'll explore like further in, in more stuff I, I don't um, because like I I made a playlist of all the electronic music I made the first year I was in Montreal, and it was eight hours long. <laughs> and um, I would never play it for anybody. That would know, never like, live like, anywhere under some like oh obscure God. moniker on a Bandcamp page or I, anything. I put, I put a couple things up on Bandcamp, but then I took them down. So I was like, oh, this is just confusing, you yeah. know? Like, because people were like, "Hey, I love your music. It's, it sounds like Aphex Twin." Um, but then there's this other record. It sounds like some guys talking the whole time you know? like, <laughs> yeah um, so it's got like a little bit too confusing and it's you know i've already had enough fans i don't need another mm-hmm. moniker there cool yeah so let's chat about that a little bit i think um you were signed to polyvinyl in 2003 with saturday looks good to me Correct. right yeah what's it been like uh, and you stayed with that label i think ever since right in, well, in some ways there, yeah in some ways like there was a saturday looks good to me record that came out on k uh in 2007 um just because i love k records mm-hmm. and uh, I was, you know, working with Calvin Johnson a little bit. I was playing drums for him for a couple of tours, and it just seemed like the right fit. I was living in the Northwest at that time. Um, but then uh, when we made a record after that, we came back and worked with Polyvinyl, and they're just so supportive of me. Like, they're seriously, like, if I was like, Polyvinyl, I want to make a record of, like, my bad electronic music, they'd be like, okay, let's do it. You know, mm-hmm. like, we'll lose money on it just because, like, we trust you, we love your vision. Um, and they've always been like that. Because uh, some of the stuff I, I come to them with, it, it's pretty weird and like not sellable it's not gonna be popular popular stuff you know like when i came up with uh, all or save the record came out in 2015 i really thought i was just gonna like live on a band camp page somewhere i put out a bunch of solo records and they're like always different always kind of like oh some songs i had lying around it's fun i tour a lot like i'll make some tapes or make like a, a lp or whatever and just put it out but that one i was like oh like i'm gonna work really hard on this and when i finished it i was like you know Let's, let's do something with this. I'm not sure, like, if it's... They had suggestions about, like, take this song off, and maybe, like, this other song, like, why is that at the end? Why don't you put it over here? And so we kind of, like, worked together on, like, a track listing and, like, just finishing the record as it was. And um, and then it really... They're like, yeah, we're going to put it out and see how it does. And it, it did so much better with press, and people really got a lot out of that record. And I owe so much of that to Polyvinyl and to um, Nathan Walker, is the publicist I have at Riot Act Media. Without that team like nobody would have ever ever heard that record it would have just been like another like drop in a bucket there's like a really cool video for uh cops don't care i'm pretty sure off of that one and like did you tour like sort of extensively more so than that one for previous stuff or i I did i I was working a full-time job at that time and um 
I, was, I had been going on like a weekend tour. I had, like record would come out and I'd come to New York and maybe play like in Philly and then, you know, just go back home. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I was like working full time, you know, uh, working at the studio. And I was like, fuck, it's time to do South by Southwest. It's time to like tour the West Coast. I haven't toured the West Coast in a minute. I did, I think I got offered like a, um, a bunch of like really good opening slots. And I was like, cool. I think I did like three or four months of touring uh, not straight but like sporadically for that record which was a huge step up from what it had been before and I kind of haven't stopped since then like I just kind of kept on being like doing more and more and more like little kind of I'm never like on tour for two months at a time as mm -hmm. I used to be but um, it might happen still you know? yeah it never ends it never um, ends I think let's work backwards a little bit and talk about I think like you have a or a, a label that was out of Ypsilanti right for some sort of local bands around that around that pot uh, Ypsilanti Michigan uh, for the uninitiated I suppose yeah Ypsilanti Michigan was a place I was born in actually mm -hmm. and um, I lived there for a little while and um, I had a label called Ypsilanti Records uh, for like a few years um, and just kind of like whatever my friends were working on I put out and I kind of switched over kind of lost interest in that and did a label called Lifelike, which I still am doing, which is really low key. It's just like tapes. I put out tapes every once in a while um, and a few records every once in a while, but it's, uh, I really couldn't spend much less energy on a label than I am. You yeah. know, like I, I, you know, I put out like a hundred copies of an LP and give 50 of them away and hope that the other 50 sell someday, you know, it, but it's more just like for things that are really esoteric and kind of, yeah. And is that just stuff like your friends or people you know come to you with and are like, I need to find a platform or a place for this kind of stuff? Or is there any sort of discovery, like digging around? A little bit of both. Like, it, it's certainly not a label that a band would be like, we got to sign to your label. Yeah. It's like, cool, man. Like, <laughs> you should probably do a better job yourself. Um, but it's a lot of friends or like, I had an idea. My friend Anna Birch is um, a songwriter in Detroit. And I used to play guitar for her band sometimes, but she has like a record coming out. It's like full band. She's got like a drummer and bass player now. And we were practicing before a gig one time and it was just like her boyfriend and this other you know roommate were chatting and um, people kind of like drinking hanging out and me and Anna were just kind of like hey, and it goes to like A minor there and, and I was like this is so nice we should make a tape that sounds like this so we got in the studio and just like kind of did the same thing where like we had a couple people hang out and we just sort of like I don't know just made this like really like mellow reading of some of her songs and um I put a tape out of it because I just had a inspiration of like, oh, like your record sounds great. It sounds like a band and it's full. And you spent like two years making it. What if we just did like an afternoon where we're just kind of like, just like that moment that I remember. So it's sort of like this, you know, a vision hmm. kind of thing. As someone who kind of has the perspective of being, you know, with a major label at that point, is that something you feel like doesn't happen that much anymore? Sort of just these smaller like labels around these these local circles in smaller cities like that. I think it's no. I think it's happening everywhere and. And those are the, the releases that people sometimes, like, you know, you have a lot more access to, like, a War on Drugs record or, mm -hmm. you know, um, whatever. Something that, you know, there's a press release for and, like, people are, like, taking out ads and, and you know, there's videos and stuff. But every once in a while, like, you know, there's stuff happening all the time and every once in a while you get a tape and be like, what's this? And you listen to it, like, this is amazing. Like, and you found out about this person because there's, like, a cassette of it or there's, like... Oh, like an errant band camp thing that like somebody sent you a link to and it's just I think that's like as exciting if not more exciting than like Pitchfork's 100 best records of the year again I bet you can bet you can guess like the top 10 you know like yeah, right. year, you know? make a game out of it or something yeah. I mean yeah is that how do you how do you sort of discover new music that you're interested to what are your are your main avenues like just people you talk to stuff people give I, you that you trust I, I like it is that for sure like people are um I, most of my friends are, you know, record nerds and people who are going to shows all the time. I, I play shows all the time and and meet people and, and uh, you know, get to see bands while they're starting sometimes, which is always really exciting for me. Um, it's always so interesting to be like, oh, yeah, I saw this band play their first shows and kind of seeing, like, where that goes. It, like, goes up or it stays kind of, like, on one level of mm -hmm. they're still playing kind of the same stuff or their sound's changing a little bit or... Sometimes it's like getting drastically different, or I don't know. I, I'm pretty much in, I'm I'm invested in the long term in, yeah. in bands, even people I'm not friends with necessarily. I'm kind of just like I like to see uh, where it goes, and and most of that is like people I play shows with or people who set shows up for me. 
when my friend Steven is opening the show tonight, like he and I were roommates when I lived here 10 years ago. Awesome. And um, I'm so stoked to like, see his solo stuff. He, he was in a band called People Get Ready before and uh, did a lot of like dancing and stuff like that. Uh, like performed with David Byrne for a long time on mm-hmm. tour. And, uh, and so it's like, what's he gonna do tonight? Like this is one of my oldest friends, uh, the band I, I'm on tour with right now that the show is a break from is Wild Bell, uh, who uh, two or three of the people in that band used to play in my band Saturday Let's Get Me, and they went in this totally different direction and have like this kind of like big, like reggae pop kind of like, they have big shows. They have like hundreds of people come to the shows and they're, they were signed to like Columbia. And I was like, oh, that's what, that's where that direction went. Um, so yeah, that's a long way of saying my ears always to the ground. Yeah. And thinking about that long term, like, how did you sort of get your start and know that music was something you wanted to do? I just, you know, like, I dropped out of college uh, because I got mono, because I got a little bit sick and I played shows every weekend. I had, like, a a punk band. Or just, like, I had a band when I was, like, 17, 18, 19, and I was so hyped on it. That's all I wanted to do, and all my relationships were kind of, like, backburnered for for this thing and I kind of just have gone with various degrees of like more health healthiness you know uh, emotional health and and like you know responsibility and respect for people in my life I kind of just kept doing the same thing you know like uh, playing shows all the time there was really never any question and people were like how about you make the money work and it's like I never even thought about it It somehow like worked out definitely were times that I was super super broke but I, I kind of just didn't care. Yeah. So playing all those shows, have you sort of? What are the differences, I guess, between like playing in a band or sort of touring as a solo act now that you see? Uh, well, when I started touring solo, um, I really it was a huge revelation to me how much it helps to have a band and how the people that I've played in bands with, like how much they were doing. You know, I, I was kind of like a prima donna when I was like, I write all the songs. I'm kind of like. I made the record make sense, so you guys are like, you're the drummer, and you're, we're gonna go on tour. It's like, oh my god, they did everything. Everybody else drove. They like called the clubs and they made sure we're gonna get there on time. And I really just like when you're doing everything by yourself, you're just like, oh fuck, I gotta like look up directions on my phone while I'm driving across like <laughs> the George Washington Bridge, and I, I'm in trouble. You know, like yeah. even like one other like set of hands and eyes, or like somebody to, like to call the club and be like, we know it says here 7 p.m. But we're gonna be a little bit closer to like 9 p.m. Like that's, you know, traveling alone is, is really, really crazy. Yeah. And apart from that, like I'm just alone all the time. And your thoughts just go in loops forever. I guess to go back to that Detroit show too, it was kind of funny. Like it was Mover Shaker who were this like really energetic, I think like four or five, four or five piece out of like Detroit. And then they had like this raucous energy. There was a bunch of kids there who were super excited, like, you know, personal friends of jazz stuff to see them, this very high energy. And then you sort of come out into this solo. And it's not like somber or anything, but it's definitely a different vibe. And then sandwiched between that and like the world is a beautiful place where, you know, they've got eight or nine people on stage and all of that energy. Like, are you seeking out these places where sort of you think your music will be sort of more well received in that regard of its confessionality and it's sort of just you or how do you how do you think about that you know I, I should think about that but I don't the world is a beautiful place uh, their guitar player Dylan really liked my records he's like he got in touch with me and uh, actually like I saw them play in Montreal with a friend of mine's band uh, into it over it and he came up at the show and was like hey like really like your band and, you know like I was like oh really nice to meet you and we kind of became friends via the internet and he's like would you be interested in doing like these shows with us and I was like sure it's just gonna be me. It's gonna be kind of like weird. And he's like, I don't care. Just like I, I just like your music a lot. And I met those people in that band. And such sweet, amazingly great people. Such a great band. I really had no idea what to expect. You know, I didn't really realize. I had heard of the band, and I think I like listened to their first record a little bit. But I wasn't like a fan. I certainly wasn't like, oh my god, man, my manager's gonna, gonna get in touch, and we've gotta like make sure we can like do some like legs to your tour. It was just like, it was just kind of like, hey, you wanna come do this thing? I was like, oh yeah, why not? And so it never really dawned on me, like, I should probably be, like, trying to play with this band because it makes so much more sense. It just kind of all happens organically, and I think it's kind of more interesting. Like, if I was, like, opening up for the Mountain Goats or, like, Ted Leo or, or Mark Cosluck or something like that, would it really be that good? Or would it just be kind of like, here's the baby version, here's the full-grown <laughs> version, you know? Like, yeah. Do you have any really great tour memories from your sort of career? Like, oh great God. shows you've played, great acts you've opened for, bands you've seen go places from small places like that? Yeah, I mean... 
I mean, I started touring when I was uh, 17, and it was really interesting. Um, I didn't drink until I was uh, 26, and so I spent a lot of time, like, totally sober on tour, and then, like, when I kind of was like, oh, I'm touring, like, nine months of the year, I kind of went into the headspace of, like, you gotta, like, drink a lot and, like, party and, like, feel crazy and, like, have, you know, a nervous breakdown when you're on tour. Um, so for me, more than, like, can I, we open up for this band and then like the next year like they open up for us like I, I don't I got to see a bunch of amazing bands in different like states of um of their career while I was in different states of my like own mentality which was the most exciting thing you know like toured with Rainer Maria uh 15 years ago and like to see them playing shows again and, and like you know 2017 is amazing you know Mates the State toured with them Ted Leo mentioned, like, Ted just made a record, like, this year, it's incredible, it's touring again, um, you know, the interesting, like, wave of, like, oh, we played here two years ago for, like, 500 people, now there's six people here, you mm -hmm. know, like, the, the arc of, like, highs and lows and how random it all feels, that's more exciting to me than, like, I saw the White Stripes for shows. Shitty, right? <laughs> <laughs> right on, yeah. So you, you dig like playing these sort of smaller, more intimate venues like that? I mean, uh, last night I, I played in front of, I think there were 400 people there and they just talked the entire time. Yeah. But there were some people there who were there to see me and by the end of it, like I had kind of like won them over. So that was kind of fun too. It was kind of cool to be like, okay, this is like a bad vibe, full disrespect, but I'm just going to keep going and you're going to like me by the end of this. Yeah. But a night like tonight where like maybe like if, if, 50 people come to this gig it's gonna feel incredible we're, we're in a very kind of small like upstairs of like a mexican restaurant it's like in bushwick it's, literally upstairs from a mexican yeah. restaurant <laughs> it's, it's yeah it's pretty like, have you played here before no, spot? no yeah. never at all you know one of my favorite uh musicians of all time is jonathan richmond you ever listen to jonathan richmond stuff i don't think so no he had a band called the modern lovers in the 70s um but he kind of went solo in a, a way where he just like he kind of started making sort of like more like children's music like mm -hmm. modern lovers was like amazing just like post velvet underground I don't know, look them up. They made one record. It was, it's a classic of all genres. But then when he went solo, it was kind of more like gentle and he hated playing with like amplification and he just has a drummer and he's like, he would love to like play at the smaller spot yeah. like this and just, and I, uh, I feel that too. You yeah. Know? I, I you can connect a little bit more easily sometimes. Is this the kind of direction you want to keep your music in these sort of like really small solo kind of stuff or is there, you think there's any change on the horizon? I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. I, I can't imagine. I played one solo show with a band um, just for this like charity event and um, it was a really special show because I kind of put a band together with like some of my best friends. Mm -hmm. and my friend Will actually like uh, he passed away earlier this year and it was the only show we played together. Um, and so I have that like really kind of like strong beautiful memory of you know like just like bringing a bunch of people together um, that can never come together again mm -hmm. and I think that might be enough for me actually yeah Excuse me. Oh, thanks man uh, so like basically pretty much outside of your bank and you kind of kind of found it interesting you don't really have much of an, an online presence is that just something you're not interested in, in whatsoever I just don't have the fucking time <laughs> I got I got things to do right? yeah, yeah yeah I gotta like gotta go to the gym every day uh, I gotta like eat at least one meal a day that's like not garbage <laughs> i have to like um do a bunch of like freelance writing stuff which is like how i make the majority of like my income mm -hmm. i have to like hang out with uh the person i'm married to i have to like maintain friendships i have no time to like beg people to listen to my music online yeah right like on. like my shit because it's good if you like it that's cool i hope you do um, and everyone listening to this, thank you for listening. I really do like want to share my music. Mm -hmm. I just don't have the the drive to to hype myself up to people. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't. I, I just don't care. I think sort of a fun maybe thing to end on then is if, if you're not aware, there's a, a pastor called Fred Thomas, and if you type in Fred Thomas on YouTube, like most of the search results are, are this guy's sermons and your music videos. I think sort of like the bottom of the first page, which I just found kind of. A funny little anecdote, especially for someone who doesn't give a fuck about any of that, like, online stuff, just sort of... Well, I, I can't front and say that I've never, like, Googled myself. Yeah. So I know about Pastor Fred <laughs> Thomas, and I also know about uh, the football player for the Saints, yeah, that's Fred right. Thomas, yep. who apparently is, like, the worst football player of all time. He's got, like, uh, some, like, interesting notables on his Wikipedia page of like, just being, like... He gets, like, decimated sometimes. Yeah, like, right people, on. Like, I, 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 every time that, like, there's a... Uh, 
Well, also uh, James Brown's bass player is Fred Thomas. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so I get confused for him in Instagram posts sometimes, even though he's like, I think he's like a 72 year old black man and <laughs> still playing bass and doing gigs and stuff, but like uh, we are different. Um, but Fred Thomas, the football player, every time he, that someone, a football player has like a bad game, people tweet at me being like, it's like when you fucked up this other game. And I was like, I don't even Definitely I didn't, wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Wasn't me. Thank you for your time so much, man. Thank yeah, you, everyone, thank for you. listening. Uh, can't wait to see the show, and uh, keep on rocking on. Cool. Thanks for awesome. having me. Awesome. Thanks.